Welcome to the Football Journeys podcast. We're here at UCFB studios at Wembley with a truly remarkable guest, Martin Sinclair. There's no question that the Sinclairs are a football family and Martin's the most capped of the lot. Born with cerebral palsy, Martin has lived by the mantra that he's here to showcase his ability and not his disability. And boy, he's done that. He's been at the Olympics with his brother Scott, while Scott and his other brother Jake have been at more than one para tournament with him. He's achieved so much as a football player but he's achieved even more as an advocate, coach, an all-round hero, inspiring those with or without disabilities to showcase their ability. Martin. Oh, look at that, that's well, a nice intro, isn't it? Well, it's great. Do you know what? I feel really smug because when we do these intros, every, every guest so far has commended me on them. So that Happy makes days. Very very, 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 very grateful to you. Look, Martin, thanks for coming on. No, no worries. We're really excited and I've already told you many times in the kind of bromance we've been de uh, developing over WhatsApp <laughs> that we are excited by you. Um, we take all of our guests right back to the beginning. Um, and actually, uh, really strange, I think I'm going to take you back to your birth, which I yeah. imagine you've got no recollection of whatsoever. Nope. But you would have spoken to your mum and dad about. Um, you were born with cerebral palsy, yeah. uh, 1986, so I've given away your age. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about well, what your mum and dad would have told you about what their experience of was. You know, what's it like to have a cerebral palsy baby in 1986? Yeah, so obviously I was born in June 27th and my my mum and dad didn't really know what a disability was. So when I was born, they didn't know what to do. And obviously when the doctors turned around and said I was at a double disadvantage, not only I was black, I was disabled at exactly the same time, but I was quite lucky because my parents always looked at my disability in a positive way than a negative way. I'm not saying... Her, their parents, their parenting is, was, the, was the right way for me. So that's probably the reason why I've got such a strong mindset. Yeah, and so you're the oldest of three boys in the family. Yeah. Um, so you were 1986, Scott 1989, Jake 1994. Um, and I said in the intro, what a football family. Um, what's it like being a, a, a boy, particularly back in those days as well? Yeah. So much progress has been made still more to be made, which is why people are like you do what you do. What's it like to be a kid with cerebral palsy in a football family? Dad was a semi-professional football, yeah. obviously a talented player himself. Um, and you you developed a, a passion for the game really, really early. But what chance is there in 19, well, it wouldn't be 1986, I guess 1990-something for a young... Yeah, there was nothing There was nothing around for disability. Um, there, no one knew what a disability was, no one knew what... Um, cerebral palsy was so I had to go into mainstream setups, mainstream holiday clubs, and I had to c come out of my comfort zone straight away. And obviously, I didn't have any role models looking up, and I didn't really have an identity when I was younger because I didn't know where to fit in, especially with being a mixed race and disabled man. I didn't really have a clue, especially when my dad was talking about his experience as racism. Mm. Obviously, I had all the questions answered, but as a disabled person I had to learn it by myself so growing up was just a learning curve for me so yeah I used to love football I used to get but in those football teams I used to get kicked out of football teams just because I was so different and because of your disability yeah and and, and actually I just want to pick you up on the, on the point about your ethnicity I know a listener will be able to hear that accent you're from out west where in the 1990s as you would have been a young lad growing up there, there would have been a largely white population yeah. And, and, and as you said, your dad would have been able to help guide you through that, yeah. whatever he would have been through. So I'm presuming your dad was a black ethnicity, your yeah. mum would have been a white ethnicity. Uh, and your mum would have been able to speak to about the prejudice that she Definitely. got. I mean, it's, um, I, I've, I've known Stan Collimore for a number of years, and he, he pointed out to me the Madness song, Embarrassment, was about a white woman yeah. having a, a mixed-race child. Um, so all of those factors that then come in, but the one thing they couldn't guide you through was what it's like to have cerebral palsy, because who can? No. Especially if, yeah, especially if I had no role models looking up to, looking up to. So I had to learn the hard way, and obviously you have to learn from mistakes. And with with that, like life is the biggest exam. Obviously at school you take lessons first to take the test second, but in life it's test first, then you learn second. And how how did it um, how did it affect you day to day? Um, so we'll pause from the early early memories that you've got as a child. Like I said before, I was quite lucky because I had such positive parents and such a positive um, family, and I always surrounded myself with positive people. So I was quite lucky on that. With school, it was quite hard because no one knew what, like I said before, enough knowledge or understanding what what I should do. So PE, I didn't go to PE. I went to the library. It was only until probably year five and year six, Mr. Stephen Carr said, "Where are you going?" 
That's the teacher's decision, is it? This this kid's got cerebral palsy. He can't do PE. Yes, because they didn't know what to do. So when you see, when you look, when you go into a setup, especially with a teacher, and didn't really know know that way. And only know one way of teaching, and then they see a disabled kid. Oh, I don't know how to adapt. And your and I'm going to use the word that you used when we we're walking up Wembley Way. Your challenge of cerebral palsy. Yeah. Um, is it something that progresses over time? Um, that the, um, the the impact it has on your body has progressed over time, or did you have the same challenge as a as a young boy that you've got in your body right now? And forgive me, that's a clumsily worded question. Before, but when I was younger, I, uh, um, I was m quite mild, so you probably didn't notice it until I got tired. The only reason why it's got a lot worse now is because they misdiagnosed me for two weeks with a dislocated hip or a broken hip, and the actual socket come off, and it was right around my back, and they said it was a pull ligament. And it was only only lucky enough that I had supposed to have an operation on my arm, and they, the doctor who done me um, done my, my operations when I was young was like, this isn't right, go to X-ray, and then obviously the the ball was rubbing against the pelvis for two weeks, and I had obviously had. And um, what age would you have been? This is this. Wow. So it's even more remarkable is what we'll come on to in a bit. Yeah, what well, I was going to say, so I'm, I want to put a pin in that one because that is a remarkable story which, which then the chain of events that follows from that then dictates the man that you became. I want to go back just slightly before you were 15. Um, and I, I'm cheating slightly because I've done my due diligence so I know a little <laughs> bit on your story. You talked about people not wanting to, to, for you to play football. You... You know, you came from a talented football family, passionate football family. I think you turned up at a local kids' football club. And I, I guess it's that, that feeling a lot of able-bodied people have is that they don't really want to deal with the issue. Of just, just, I, don't, I don't want the challenges that person's got because I haven't yeah. got them in my life, so I'll just ignore it. And I think you went for a trial at a local football club and the coach at the end just went, no, I'm sorry, I don't think he can play for us because he's disabled. Yeah, and that was, that was the way, way it was. So I went to a few training sessions. Obviously, it was like, OK, that's happy days. And then went to a few matches, didn't get selected or didn't get come on and then my mum and dad piped up and said oh so why isn't my son playing oh it's because he's disabled so he went obviously I w left that club and went to another club which the guy was absolutely brilliant Andy Nicholson he's pitched shout out for Twerton and Athletic yeah Twerton and Athletic <coughs> he's, pa he's passed away now but he's was probably the best role model I had when I was younger because it wasn't just about my disability it was what football gave me the confidence the self-belief the understanding of teamwork, team players, socialising, and that w that's what it was all about. He wasn't really good at coaching, but man management, it was unbelievable. So when he invited me in, I went to training sessions, and I played my first match against the team, kicked me out in the first place, and I scored a hat-trick. <laughs> but that, that excitement was short-lived because someone reported me to the local FA and I was banned for two months just because I, there was a disabled person playing in that league. I, I, I find it difficult to get my head around that, that story. I mean, one, I can't get my head around still what would be the motivation of someone reporting a young kid just ex exploring their passion, which is football. But two, I can't understand what rules are in place that prevent someone with a disability playing football. And I, and I don't know whether you, well, you probably do know because you've been quite involved in grassroots football. Um, someone with cerebral palsy now, if you've got, I don't know, a 12-year-old kid with cerebral palsy, no. is he allowed to play you're allowed to play uh, the same age group, but you're allowed to play one year younger. So, yeah, when not yeah. So when when I had that investigation, it was quite challenging because all I wanted was to play football. It wasn't about me playing professional football or Premiership, or it was just about me having a good time and ha having a smile on my face. And that's what it's all about. It's also about other in you as well, by the way. So it's that moment you get reported and you get banned from playing at that point. It's like saying, "No, sorry, mate, you're not." You're not in this. You're yeah, not part of it. yeah, and people scared are different, and that's probably why I think people think, oh, why has he got a disability, but he still plays the way he can, yeah. and then people don't have that understanding, that education around it. So, oh, okay, and that's why people probably coming out of their comfort zone thinking you need more people like that. It comes a little bit from fear as well, you know. Yeah, yeah. There's two ways to look at it: fear you can face everything and run, or face everything and rise. Oh. I like that. Yeah, well, which is exactly what you've done throughout your life and in, in, in your career. Um, can I ask you just a bit, little bit about other kids? Um, it's interesting. I, I chatted to you. We, we had David Clark on this podcast. He's a huge friend of ours. Um, and he talks about kids. <coughs> and the key with kids, so he coaches a sighted football team and he, he's blind. 
And he said the first day he turned up, he had a million questions. And as soon as those questions had been asked and answered, that was it, crack on. Because kids will accept difference quite early, as long as it is put out in the open. Um, we also had Sean Miter on, who's a double amputee. Yeah. And because kids are naturally inquisitive, um, he, he, he experiences a lot of parents getting very embarrassed when you know, a four-year-old will point at Sean and say, oh, a man's got no legs or whatever else comes up. Um, is that something you would have had to experience as a young kid? You know, one, bullying, but two, also kids coming over to you and say, oh, what's wrong with your left hand? Or I, I would rather have someone to come up to me and go, what's wrong, instead of Chinese whispers, Chinese whispers and going, oh, what's wrong with him? What's, what's, what's wrong with his disability? What's doing this? I would rather someone come up to me and go, what's wrong? Yeah. What's, what's wrong with your arm? What's wrong with your leg? And then obviously explain and then that, that's when the education comes from. Yeah. So they see double side. And do you, do you get that feeling that, that people who are not well equipped to deal with that stuff will just try and avoid someone like you? And that's a bizarre thing to say. I, I find it bizarre that that would even be in someone's mindset, but they see you limping, um, they see the way that your left hand is and think, oh, I'm not comfortable with this, so I'm going to remove myself. Is that perception? Is that perception is like, I don't want to come out of that comfort zone to have that conversation, especially when when um, my auntie's profound deaf is like having that conversation, that initial, who feels uncomfortable first? Is it them or is it us? And it's exactly the same when you're, when you're going up to someone with a disability is who's, who's more scared of having that first initial conversation or that first question. And did you socialise with anyone else that had cerebral palsy or any kind of community at this point? So I didn't meet anyone with cerebral palsy until I got into the England team. Wow. Wow. And what age was that? That was 21. 21. And would you have researched or looked into anything or it, it was probably a little bit different then, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Go down the local yeah. library back yeah. in yeah. those days, yeah. Google yeah, yeah, back exactly. then. But, um, yeah, so it was just all word of mouth yeah. um, when I was younger. And it's got, it's got a lot better, yeah. really, because of social media and stuff and the Paralympics. and and everything else but yeah back back when i was younger it was just word of mouth wow let's take you to that point at the age of 15. um you fell off a slide <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um which and it's funny we all laugh at that i mean the consequences for you at the time were absolutely devastating so your hip was dislocated at that point or it broke yeah it broke at that time it wasn't dislocated it broke yes, sends my stomach over to hear that um <laughs> And because of your cerebral palsy condition, is is that why the the damage to you was as bad? Yeah, it's because when I when I um, played for England, I had a physio called Ollie Davis. He said that's the most um, injury you have if you had cerebral palsy, the uh, with a slip hip emphasis with um, cerebral palsy people. And I didn't obviously people didn't know that when I was younger. So when I come off the slide, I was with my best mate daughter just. <laughs> On, on, on me and then she, we went down because it was too, the slide was quick and I'd just come off and landed on my hip. I was supposed to be going on the holiday two weeks later and I didn't go. Wowzers. Can you, can you still remember vividly the accident itself? Yeah. The yeah. pain you were in and yeah. the f feeling that something was wrong? Yeah, my, my best mate's dad, um, Paul, had to pick me up and put him in his car and drove to my house and my mum and dad was like, oh, what's wrong with you? And rushed me down to hospital. And that's when I got a diagnosis saying it was a poor ligament. And they put me into an intense physio for that two weeks. And then I'd love to tell our listeners that after two weeks, you're back on your feet, but you weren't. No, nope. I was in a wheelchair. I was in a wheelchair because it got obviously got a lot worse. And then when I, when I was supposed to have the operation on my hand, doctor, the Mr. Jones, Clegg Jones said, rushed me down to the x-ray me and they got me in with emergency surgery that day. And when you say you were in a wheelchair, I mean, I'm not sure it was the whole three years that you were in a wheelchair. I think I've, I've written the word Zimmer down there. I know that you were using a Zimmer yeah, frame, yeah. but for three years you were really immobile. Yeah, I was in and out of hospital for eight years. I had 20 operations near enough on my hip. I was yeah, in a wheelchair for three, near enough three and a half years with a Zimmer frame, so I didn't have that mobile. So if I was walking long journeys or had long journeys, I would be, I would be in my wheelchair because I couldn't have that level of... And that level, and, and I know that your focus at that point is not, I'm going to be a footballer, I'm going to play in Paralympics. But you think of, in your early years, you started to play a bit of football. Yeah. That wasn't taken away from you. But you, you're still, you know, you're an active teenage boy, notwithstanding the challenge of cerebral yeah. palsy. And then to have a three-year period of your life, 15 to 18, and what a period of your life, and think what you were doing age 15 to 18 at Chelsea's Academy, at Brentford's Academy, to have that taken away from you. I want to ask what it did to your physical health, but actually probably the best question is what does that do to your mental health, your sense perception of who you are? 
I was quite, I was quite lucky because, like I said before, I was surrounded by positive people. And at the time, my brother was playing football for his underage group, and that just gave me a bit of positivity as well, seeing what he went through and stuff. Bristol Rovers. Bristol Rovers at the time. And that's where that's where it comes from. I always believe everything happens for a reason. If I didn't probably go down that route, I probably wouldn't be so successful that or so successful playing football and doing what I'm doing now. But it's it's gave me a. If I didn't have that, I wouldn't be where I'm talking to you guys about the the story I had. Well, forgive me, Mike. Like the listeners won't have realised I'll point to Fraser when <laughs> yeah. you made that point because it's something that Fraser is a big believer in. Obviously, he's gone through loads of challenges, and um, that's what brings him his strength. I'm sat in the middle here, and I'm going to. Uh, we won't discuss this, but I actually don't agree that things happen for a reason. I think what, the way that you two have responded to it is what you should be so proud of, and it doesn't matter whether it's meant for a reason or not. The way that you've responded has been incredible, and that's what you should be most proud of. But I know I'm, I'm with you, Martin. Don't worry about that. <laughs> no. um, well, we talk about things happening for a reason. Yeah. Um, so, you, I mean, there's no question you would have been at a low point during those three years at certain yeah. points. You were you were pulled through by your strength of character, by an incredible family, and actually, and and that's quite interesting through Scott's uh, career, which and, and Scott's career and, and the way that. Scott's career has gone and your career has gone, yeah. and Jake's as well, yeah. who's a talented footballer and has, has had some great success in football as well. Um, and I'm sure as the youngest boy, in, with everything you, you two boys have done, sometimes he feels a little bit pushed he, He's side. probably the most talented um, guy, brother, out, out of the all three of us. Yeah. He's, he was the most gifted. Does he feel a bit annoyed sometimes no, no, that you two no, will get all the credit? When you, <laughs> when, you get, when you get to that certain level, you probably, Fraser probably knows this, it's, he's lost a bit of love for it. He lost that. I don't know if it was pressure, but he just fell out of love with football mm -hmm. at 18, 19. And that's when he just thought, yeah. And if you don't fall, if you fall out of love with football and don't enjoy it anymore, that, that's when the pressure, pressure comes. And that's when you don't really want to go through the same mental strength. Because it doesn't matter how much talent you are, the mental side of things and see what my brother went through, Scott, and the, the, right, the highs and the lows. And we go on a bit with Redden. If he, did, if he didn't win, it, would he be the, exact, the same person he, was, yeah, he is yeah. today? So it's all winning and losing, yeah. dealing with it. So, yeah, I just think he's he's in a good place at the moment with Jake, and obviously Scott's doing well for himself as well. Um, and and on that following um, Scott at that point, when your your mobility is restricted, yeah. you're in a wheelchair or a Zimmer frame and all of that. Um, notwithstanding your pure love for him and your enjoyment of his journey, is there an element? in you at that point and there is always a temptation to feel sorry for ourselves and i feel sorry for myself quite often i always work against that because i know yeah. it's the wrong thing to do but is there an element sometimes with you as the older brother as well where you're watching you're watching scott on the picture watching that he's achieved when you're a young lad you're sat in a wheelchair on a zimmer frame whatever else and thinking why did it have to be me that had cerebral palsy why did it have to be me that's in a wheelchair on the zimmer frame at that point he he no nah, no nah, I, I don't see it as that like like i said but before did you at the time did no, because he he's doing he's living his life and I'm living my life. I only live one way, and that's me as a disabled person. I knew for when I was younger I wouldn't be able to play football because of the insurance side of things and stuff. I wouldn't be able to do do that. So he's living his dream, and I'm living my dream. So I'm just going to help him on the on the way and help him on his journey. Yeah, it's obviously seeing seeing um, him play football in front of so many fans. It's just it it's, puts a smile on my face. I can quite, I can quite see that. Um, I'm I, I just a slight hesitation there because I know I'm about, then now about to bring the movie right down. You know what's coming. Yeah. What my next question will be. So in 2003, um, I would imagine this probably short of falling off the slide was one of the central moments, central awful moments of your life. So in 2003, you went with a group of friends, and would you have been in a wheelchair at that point? Yeah, I just come out of hospital. Wow, so it's, and you go to a place called Holcomb Quarry, which is in Bath or near Bath. Yeah, near Bath. So it's a group of kids aged 15 and 16. Um, I think it's height of the summer, yeah. really warm. Um, well, I'll let you take the story from there. So yeah, I just come out of hospital. My mate turned around and said, do you want to come out? Because obviously you haven't been out for a while. So it's like, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, brilliant. And my, uh, his other mate had a car at the time. So he, we went in the car, obviously picks the girls up, as you do as teenagers. And we went to a local Holcomb Quarry and then he he got me out of the car and then visually enough he just put me in put in my wheelchair and he pushed me and he fell down a bank 
and fell in the prickle bush and I just started laughing at the time because he, he couldn't um, he couldn't go, oh, I'm stung, I'm stung, I'm, I'm badly stung. And then when I got to um, the quarry, he turned around and said, I can't swim. And then when we got to the top of the lift, I was talking to a girl and he turned around. When I turned around, he had his boxer shorts on and ran and jumped. So, so, just so you've got that space. conversation going through your mind. So it's ben, ben has told you, I can't swim. Yeah. And then you've looked around and he's in his box. Yeah, he couldn't swim. And I was like, oh no, what's, what am I doing? And then I wheeled to the edge, didn't really ha have any hesitation, just hopped off the edge in my wheelchair. And then obviously I couldn't bring him up. When I, had, I got him, but I couldn't bring him up with my bad hand. And that was probably the first time when I didn't, didn't want a disability. So you've got, I mean, you're, hold, you're holding Ben at that point. Yeah, holding Ben at the time. He was struggling. I, he was six foot at the time and I grabbed him with my strong hand but I couldn't and you're kicking your legs could trying to get trying to get bring him up and I obviously slipped straight out of my hands and that was probably the first time when I didn't want a disability so Ben slips away into the water I mean you you, you see you see him slip away yeah. I mean at that point presumably everyone's shouting yeah I eat he couldn't, he, he was panicking, so like the t two, two people, the two girls were up there screaming, shouting, and I was trying to, he was panicking, kicking, I, yeah, I, I could have lost my life as well, but I didn't look at his that, I just wanted to, yeah, yeah, definitely, I just wanted to bring him up and just save him. Um, what do you remember after, that? Do, you, do you remember Ben just disappearing? disappearing helicopters were going around and then I had to wait on because I couldn't climb up I was waiting there for about 45 minutes for a crew to come and save me but I was cold at the time wow. and they wrapped me up in foil and went and then I went to the RUH the Royal United Hospital. Were you I mean you went to hospital after that yeah. and then, my mo yeah, then, then the conversation I had was with my mum was oh they're trying to say they're trying to find Ben and I was like trying to figure out in my head why are they trying to find Ben when he's, he's, he's drowned. You, you were certain he's, he's gone? Yeah, yeah. And then my dad turned around, and then, I got, I was, then I got angry, and then my dad turned around and went, oh, shut up, shut up. And I was like, but dad, he's, he's, he's dead. And he was like, oh no. And then when I, when I went home, then I had the knock on the door, banging on the door, and it was um, Ben's mum, Donna. And I just burst out crying. How does a, what were you, 15 then, 16? Yeah. How's a 15 year old come to terms with something? Not six, no, 15, so tell like it was 70 when I was 17. Oh, you were 17. 17. But yeah, it's like, what can you do? That's what, I wanted to cut my hand off at the time. I didn't really want to have this, uh, this disability because people would turn around, oh, if you didn't have a disability, you would save him. And that was when I was like, oh. and that's when I questioned everything. Yeah. Did you get help through that period? Yeah, yeah, I did, I did. Uh, but it was, it, it was quite hard at that mm -hmm. time because turned to drink and that was probably the like a release mm -hmm. just a get out get out clause just drinking myself drink 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 and it was I felt normal at the time mm -hmm. thinking yeah I could do this and then the day after it just hits me again it's a it's a form of it's a form of self-medicating yeah and obviously not wanting to think about what had happened and I've had my own experience with that which I talk to a lot of clubs about but I know Paul Gascoigne had something really similar um, I know he was, I'm, I'm sure the story is he was walking, walking to the shop as a kid and his next door neighbour and the mum said, oh, can you take him with the, the little boy? And when he's walking to the shop, um, the little boy runs across the road and gets hit by a car and, and dies in his arms, basically. And I remember watching his documentary and him saying he used to drink on that because he'd get those memories coming up and he wasn't getting the help or the therapy or dealing with the issue. He was just trying to forget it through drinking. Yeah and did that for year after year after year. And it's, um, you know, it might not be as severe as that, but a lot of people do that day to day. It's like, we talk a lot about escapism when we go in and it's, it might not be drink, it might be drugs, it might be gambling, it might be whatever your outlet is, but it's, it's so important to understand what's actually going on and trying to deal with it, you know, rather than turn it to some kind of substance. But I think sometimes also you have to go through that. You have to go through, you know, understanding that this isn't going to work and I have to figure things out going forward and yeah. how did that look for you? Life's not straightforward sometimes you have to take two steps back to take one step forward go in different directions and it, yeah it was a long time when I I didn't blame myself but yeah a long period of time was, was like 
this is the reason why he's not here, this is the reason why he's not here. And then obviously the drink and the drugs kept me like a coping mechanism, thinking, yeah, just a day to day. And then, but with drinking, I was going to the extreme, like trying to be paralytic, not think about it the next day and stuff. So that was probably, yeah, the most difficult time. Did your family know about your drinking stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My mum's worried now when I get every time I go out, but I know, I know there's a my limit now. Yeah. I think it's only recently I know my limit, but it was so. <laughs> it's only when, yeah, it's my my mum and dad. When I go out, it's like, oh, am I going to get this phone call again? It's interesting with you saying that you know your limit. I've had a lot of conversations with Fraser, and I've I've, I've reduced my alcohol intake as a yeah. result of conversations with Fraser. I've not completely eliminated alcohol, and I think you are an extreme person. Um, so therefore that's why you're not able to limit your alcohol, which is why you've completely eliminated alcohol. Um, I guess, perhaps Martin, you might be like me, that you might be able to limit it, but what happened to you was a disastrous situation which then drove you yeah. to, to, to the drink. And you know well, what works for you wouldn't have worked for you, Fraser, was probably the, the, the best way of putting it. It's because of my disability as well, so that's how I, why I lower my, because obviously I get when, when I do drink, my arm goes up. And then my leg. Goes You've up. got a physical. Yeah, this yeah. is no. I've had too many because my yeah. my arms so high. When, <laughs> when um when I when I was working at Southampton, and I said to my um, my boss at the time, like, if I if I have a spasm, I have to go home. And it happened at work. And he probably didn't believe me at first, thinking, "Hang on a minute, what's, what, my hand goes up." It happened at work, and I was like, "You got to go home." So when I was walking through the corridor, there's another my other colleague right down the other end, and my hand was up there, and she was running. I was like thinking, "Why is she running?" She ran and jumped and gave me a high five. <laughs> but she didn't realise when she got back into the office, like, oh, where's Martin going? Oh, he's had a spasm. And obviously, oh, she what, what is the, um, just, just uh, a question, what is the effect of a, a spasm for you if, if that happens for you? So, yeah, when it's doing too much work or overloading. So when I was, um, when I was fitter, when I was younger playing football, it took two to three, four days. But when now, now I'm getting older and, and I've retired, I didn't have that exercise all that flexibility it takes a lot longer now yeah I've, when when um, I was working with Sky at the time I in the Covid period my disability caught up with me so obviously I didn't do no exercise I changed my routine when I re retired as so I didn't do any exercise no form of flexibility or um, stretching so my arm got tighter and tighter and then bam it I was out of action for about two years and it was up and down all the time. And when, when we talk about the challenge of, of cerebral palsy, again, I'm just stealing things from our conversation as we're walking in here. You, you mentioned that exercise is very important for people with cerebral palsy. And you th go back to the 80s and 90s where there wasn't that kind of messaging. Um, not everyone wants to be a Paralympian and will come on to the yeah. Paralympics and para games and all that kind of stuff. But there are a lot of people impacted by cerebral palsy. And for them to hear messaging from people like you about fitness and, you know, Fraser, you do it very well for, for, for people, you know, how important fitness is for our mental health, for us to get through the day, for us to have purpose and all that kind of stuff. It's very, very important for people, with, actually not just cerebral palsy, with, with, with any disabilities, the stronger we are physically, the more we can cope with the challenges which our condition gives us. Yeah, definitely. Excuse me. <clears throat> when I, when I realised when, when it did happen, that's when I was doing a lot of swimming, but it's harder. I'm not going to lie, it is a lot harder because my disability is a lot tighter as well. Because I, I, you know, as you get older, you, you lose that flexibility. But as a, as a person with a disability, it's more... But I thought I was terminated when I was younger, thinking I, I, I could do it. I don't need to do all that. But now it's caught up with me. That's when I realised I need to do some form of... Ex even, even food as well. If I, don't, if I eat rubbish food, I feel rubbish myself. But I need, yeah, so I need to eat right as well. And that's what gets you going as well, your mental health as well. So, yeah, it all connects. Which then brings us nicely to football. So in your narrative right now, we haven't actually got back to when your football career really started in earnest. You played a little bit as a youngster. You then had that awful period in, in a wheelchair, punctuated by that tragedy as well. Um, and it, and it's, it's a nice kind of part of the narrative of how important Scott's career was to you. Because it was actually only a loan move to Plymouth. Yeah where he played under the incomparable Ian Holloway. Um, and what's interesting about Ian Holloway is he's so well known for his kind of um, messing around and being very funny. He's got a great sense of humour. 
I don't think that does him justice from what I understand about him. I think he is, he is such, he is a person that's so open to difference. He's interested in mental health and, and being a good people person. And it was Ian that got you involved with doing some coaching. I think it was part of the Plymouth Foundation, which kind of brought you to understanding that there was a kind of pan-disability football yeah. team. And that's what brought you back into football. Definitely. I mean, with Ian, he was, um, I, feel, I see him as a leader, like who, he's got his, vision is empowers people inspires people but he also thinks outside the box with load of managers now they they think inside the box and think but with him he looked at what I could do rather what I couldn't do so when I got invited down to um, do a bit of coaching he looked at what I could do rather than my disability so I've got invited down there with Mark Rivers a good friend of mine now he we've done a little bit of coaching role in the in the community in the summer and that's how I found out about the disabled side and then went for a trial then. But I didn't, before going back to, it wasn't about me playing for England or the Paralympics. It was just about me having that confidence, self-belief and meeting m people who's got the same. Or also different challenges. Yeah, different Quite challenges. Yeah, there. definitely. Yeah. Learning disability, yeah. cerebral palsy, blind, hearing impairment, everything. It's a big reason for us doing this podcast is trying to get that perspective for ourselves, but then give it to people that we work with. So we have had, we've had blind, uh, we've had Paralympians, we've had people that have lost legs and we've had, you know, female footballers, whatever it might be, from different areas of the game, men footballers, academy footballers. Um, and it is getting that different perspective. Um, and I think when you look at Ian Holloway and you look into his story, he had that and, and probably a big reason he had that was his home life. Yeah. I know his, his daughters are, I think his two daughters that he's got that are both deaf. Yeah. Um, so he's got that perspective and that understanding which then enables him to have that, you know, empathy or compassion or understanding a little bit when it comes to someone that is a little bit different or has a, a different um, attribute to, to, you know, the people that he's used to working with. And if we can get everyone thinking like that, and like, it's, a, it's a brilliant thing to say what you can do rather than what you can't do, because I think too many people think, I can't do that because of this. So actually, like, there's so much value in there. How can we use him? How can he, you know, be a benefit to us? But it's having that, open-mindedness like you said and thinking outside the box and that understanding and that's what drives us to do this a lot of the time definitely definitely i always believe that everyone has a gift and it might take you a day it might take you a week it might take you months or years to figure that out but you will be good at something and it doesn't matter what it is you grab when you do find that out you grab hold of it and that's when people will try and, and that's when people will value more as well thinking oh if you're good at this it doesn't matter what um disability you have or what what struggles you have they still try and help you but you need that education or that knowledge around that to showcase that and you don't have to be the best at it I love that everyone has a gift I think sometimes we put so much pressure on ourselves and I say this as a dad you know dealing with my, with my kids when they'd been down on themselves that my daughter's very good at art but she says oh I'm not the best well I don't care that you're not the best you do have a gift for art it's something that you can express yourself you can be really proud of yourself and you can lose yourself in this and well, look, the thing that you lost yourself in was football, and you do have a gift yeah. for football. And I said in the intro, you got more caps than anyone else in your family, even notwithstanding Scott's storied career. Um, I think, did you retire on 50, exactly 50 caps? 53 caps, 53. 53. So but when I was playing for England, I wasn't, I wasn't the best. I, wasn't, I didn't have great speed, I didn't have great strength. In the England team, by the in way. England this team. is in the England team. In the England team, by the way. <laughs> and the only reason probably why I've got, had a long longevity playing playing for England is because of probably my mindset and being the best version of myself and I didn't focus on B or C I just focus on A because when you look in the mirror what do you see your, your own your own competition is yourself no one else and that's probably why people look at it, probably doubters of social media and oh, I'm not that good and people don't really want to do nothing it's like but you are good you just have to take one step at a time and if you look at the bigger picture, that's when, so exactly the same with if you're doing the gym and you want a, a, a body but you don't see the benefits after two weeks, then I'm not doing this anymore. Mm. Just take it one step at a time, what can you see? And that's why people, I think, go wrong. Yeah. They see the bigger picture and think, oh, I need to get to the end goal as quick as possible instead of being patient. And did you always have that? You know, when you are introduced to the world of cerebral palsy football, is it easy or is it difficult to start comparing your level to other people's levels or noticing you know what they had that was the same as you what they had was slightly different to you 
definitely it was when, the time was when it, when I was trying to get into the 2016 in Rio, and um, Keith Webb, the manager at the time, said, "I'm gonna, I'm just gonna be straight with you. I'm gonna pick a team with uh, mobility, and obviously I wasn't that quick, I, agile. I wasn't quick or nothing. So I lost focus. So I was trying to do speed work for about six, seven months, and, and lost where." lost the A what got me into England in the first place in the Paralympics in the first place and that's when I probably only got 2% better quicker and it probably 10 yeah 10% 15% yeah. on my other um, things what I was good at and that's probably when when after 2016 that's when I was like thinking I need to focus on what I'm good at focus on what what I'm good at one two or three and then pick those out and instead of thinking because I'm not going to be as quick, doesn't matter how much training I do, I won't be as quick as Scott or Jake. Yeah. So you just have to focus on what you can do. And just for a, a little bit of education on, on para football, um, I've done a little bit of research, but you might have to help me on this. There are, there are grades of the disability that cerebral palsy creates or equivalent neurological yeah. damage, because obviously we spoke yeah, with yeah. Jack Rutter and he doesn't have cerebral palsy, but he qualified for a time. Yeah. Um, so it's from CP1 to CP8. Um, in the most basic of understanding, CP1 is probably the most is, is the most serious. Someone that's confined to a yep. wheelchair to CP8, the least serious. And you are at uh, CP7. So it's changed. So that oh, it okay. was it was f when before before I re when I retired in two thousand the first time when I retired in two thousand sixteen it was five six seven then it was eight. And then they got rid of the eights, and that's the reason why Jack couldn't play afterwards. And then, of, and then it changed again with one, two, and three. So the least um, impaired, the most impaired, and then people who got those in in the middle. So as a five, as a five will move to a one. A sevens like hemiplegic will be class as twos. So from a seven to a two, and then three was minimal. So is that is that? <laughs> if you look at me, if I'm going cross-eyed, Martin, you'll under, you'll understand. But yeah, it's um. So when yeah, when I retired the first time, that's because I wanted to, and then when because obviously the classification changed when I went back, my number changed from two to one because I was more affected. Right. And was is there quite a big or was there quite a big debate on? You know, you might look at someone in in another team and almost go. There doesn't seem to be much wrong with him. Yeah. That was there, that kind of thing. Like, yeah, the Ukraine and Russians, <laughs> they they are they've got a national football league for CPs, and that's where that yeah they're 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 a machine. They're unbelievable. You just think, how are they get into that level of comparison? But they're training full time. Mm -hmm. They're full time athletes. Yeah. The England team is only, I would say, semi pro kind of thing. They train once a month, twice a month. And it's probably not enough for them to bridge that gap, but you're not going to bridge that gap if you haven't got the money, the funding, but you need that funding to get to that next level, but you're not going to get that funding if you're not hitting the targets. So we're in that catch-22, but it's, a, it's, it's been amazing from 2012, and that's when it's picked up, and it's, and it's got a lot better. And it's interesting you mentioned Ukraine, so I had a conversation on, online with Jack. The other day, he's coaching the, the, the CP team. We've got a World Championships. So I think it's World Championships coming up, uh, and the group is Netherlands, Spain, maybe it's a European Championship, Italy. Anyway, and Italy. Thank you. And I messaged him and said, "Oh, group of death." He said, "No, actually, not. Yeah. They're, they're not that strong." He said, "Ukraine are, are really strong in that respect." So let so we should take you to 2012 because the fight, and, and I'm going to take you back from the final. The final in 2012. It's amazing to say this out loud. In 2023, was Ukraine against Russia, which. Um, probably, uh, well, wouldn't happen um, at this uh, uh, stage in any event. But 2012 was incredible. Um, it was incredible because you were there as a Paralympian um, with Team GB. But not only that, a month or so before, Scott was there with the Team GB, uh, the only time that Team yeah. GB has had a, an Olympics football team. Was Scott motivated to, to be in that Olympics team because he knew his big brother was going to be in the Paralympics. Today. Definitely, definitely. And when, when he found out that, that we got a phone call and he was look, mowing the lawn. <laughs> Always have a little the bit of banter. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, he was mowing the lawn for mum and dad. And um, he obviously got the news that he was part of it. And I didn't, I didn't get the news until probably uh, three weeks after. But 
when he found out that I was part of it, he like, the whole family was like really really glad that we we not made history, but it's it was part of yeah. But we didn't know that we made history. It was just that oh my god, what have we done? He's in the Olympic team and I'm in the Paralympic team, and it was yeah, just a smile on your face. It's one of those moments which can never be taken away from you. No, no, especially from the things what I went before done before and what I went through before, but it's a moment when I walked into that um, moment when Team GB said their name and walked in f in front of 80,000 people, I lost my head. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my God, I was running up the crowd trying to surf. I was like, yeah, it's, it was mad, mad times. But yeah, no, no one can take that moment away. And, and, t and so CP Football 7 aside, yeah. and so what... what that was played at Wembley, was it? No, no, it was played on a hockey stadium, hockey pitch, 3G. Not 3G, it was like an AstroTurf. And so it was the Milton Keynes one, was it? Yeah. yeah. Not Milton Keynes, it was actually in the lo the hockey stadium. Oh, where is that? Sorry, I'm being stupid. Um, where was it? It was just right outside the stadium. Right, OK. Yeah, in shop, yeah. Oh, OK. But yeah, it was based, sand-based, and I had a big, I can remember I had a, um, Puma made me a big platform, but I couldn't run because I looked like I was going to break my ankle. Oh, wow. <laughs> but yeah, it was the best experience of my life. Um, the bad news for you on that was that you had a group with, um, and, and we had this in blind football with David Clark. He said Brazil are excellent at that as well. Brazil were in your group, yeah. but also were uh, Ukraine, and I think they absolutely smashed you because they are so good. They are they are really good. They they train for their their full time athletes, and yeah. obviously if we was we only train two months before, quite um, two t two times a day. So but they were training all year round, and obviously if we're getting to that level, it's yeah it's hard. We tried to make a plan, and it and it didn't work. But yeah, it was. But to to have been there was 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 the achievement, and also to have been there at Wembley to watch Scott play for. Team GB as well. Yeah, I supported Scott before before I um, made the Paralympic debut, and he he was he, they were doing well. Um, but I want to take you to a different Wembley game now, and this is really selfishly from us. <laughs> so a year before, it was at Wembley, wasn't it? it wasn't at Cardiff that time? Was it 2011? No, Wembley. It was at Wembley. Um, so we had Brian McDermott on our podcast, and Fraser and I are great friends with Brian now, and he works with us. Um, and Brian goes in and, and gives presentations at football clubs to coaches, to academy players, to all sorts about the up and down nature of football, the struggles he had with mental health, the feeling of imposter syndrome, um, and how he tried to sort of cure the problems he had with his mental health with, well, if I can just get to the Premier League, if I can just do this. And one of the toughest moments of his entire football career was at Wembley in 2011. He led out Reading against Swansea City and there's a, there's a lovely video that Brian uses in his presentations and we've sat there you know talking to Brian and watching Brian's presentations and we watched that video and we can see the hardship that Brian's go through at that point and, and it was actually the last time we were at Brentford with Brian and he showed the video and I think I'd already made contact with you by yeah. that stage and I looked up and went hang on a minute that's Martin's brother so Scott was playing for Swansea that day yeah. not only that he scored two penalties and a goal from open play he scored a hat trick um, and bearing in mind that it's really crazy, that incredible, unerring love that you have for Scott and pride in everything he did. Um, and I know that you're incredibly proud of your own achievements, but that must have been one of the most wonderful days of your life, even though it was one of the worst of Brian's. Yeah, definitely. Like sport and football is small, small margins. And it, sometimes you win, sometimes you it, it, that little, you can go either side. When I watched Scott oh, beforehand, I had a dream that he was going to score a hat trick. But when I told my wife that he was going to score a hat-trick and I'm going to put some big money on it, she's like, don't be so stupid. He's not going to, he's going to score, but he's who not going to, who scores, who scores, a, who scores a hat-trick at the playoff final? I was like, that's true, actually. And I've obviously done a bit of research and it wasn't that yet, but it was a long time ago. I can't remember who it was the last time. And then, yeah, that was it. I was, I was few, well, I wasn't fuming, but, I was, uh, but I, it was it big odds. Was, <laughs> no, but yeah, the when, when the final was unbelievable. I was in the um, in the crowd. My my mum and dad was up in the box watching it, but the crowd was unbelievable. Especially when Scott scored a hat trick, it was yeah. I tried to get on the pitch afterwards, but the security <laughs> guy didn't let me. <laughs> but 
yeah, it was the yeah probably one of the proudest moments watching Scott, especially when he was buzzing as well because he couldn't talk after in his interview. He couldn't get his words out. But yeah, it was a great day. Have you have you had um, you know taken on that role of you know that big brother role throughout his career of, of being that person that understands the game, understands really dramatic ups and downs away from football. Have you have you always been really close and, and someone that you know Scott can confide in when he has you know gone through big highs and big lows? Yeah, like I said, the mindset is probably the most um, with footballers. Mm with it now with a bad game and the social media side of things as well getting criticism but he comes to me when when it's something when he does go through some bad moments or he does question himself or does have self-doubt it's like listen there's no, there's no need just just forget think about it for five minutes mm -hmm. and then forget about it it's like holding holding this um this water if you hold it for a minute it doesn't doesn't hurt but if you hold it for a couple of hours your arms stuck, but the weight of the water is still exactly the same. It's exactly the same in your mind. If you if you listen to yourself for five minutes and then forget about it, it's fine. But if you keep forgetting b about bad stuff and what you've done in that game and bad things about, you're, it's going to get faster and you're going to be thinking about. Oh, you've got some great little gems that I'm going to take yeah. from the other. <laughs> <laughs> you you're quite reluctant to accept yourself as an inspirational individual and and, and um, which which is nonsense by the way because you are um how much of an impact and you're you're the wrong person to, to ask this we should ask scott this but how and jake as well um how important is it to them that you have overcome such incredible adversity um well those three things being born with cerebral palsy having that terrible accident um with, with your hip and then and, and then witnessing that that terrible tragedy to have overcome those three things and to have achieved what you've achieved, I hope Scott will forgive me on this, is more impressive than what Scott's achieved. And I know you won't accept that, but I'm pretty certain I know the love he has for you, he would. That must motivate him, it must motivate Jake to be the best, best version of themselves. Yeah, I think like, everyone has a plan when everything's going really well, but no one has a plan when everything goes wrong. And when I was younger, and they'd probably seen me when I was going through operations and um, losing my friend and getting kicked out of football teams and the other stuff as well, going into bars and this and that. And I can't, sometimes I can't get served in a bar because I'm disabled because I'm, they think I'm too drunk, but I'm not because my heart just had a spasm. And hearing those stories kind of thing, it's like, yeah, maybe, but at the same time, I'm living my life and he, they're living their life and, and they were only supporting each other. So we can't be jealous of one another. We just have to guide each other in the right way and go in the right direction. That could be anything, whatever they want to achieve. Or taking inspiration from, and that's what I said about how I've reduced my drinking because of what you talk about and taking inspiration. Like I'm ne like this, this guy's six foot two and you should see him with his shirt off. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I can't compete with Fraser, but what I can do is take inspiration from some of the things that he does. And, and, and I guess I, hopefully I influence you in some of the other things that I do. And it's taking inspiration from other people's journeys. I mean, it's the whole point of the podcast. That it's, it is really, really important. But actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to focus on that. There's one thing that you said that, that's, well, everything you say is interesting, but um, what you said about being served. And I was reminded of a, a scene in, in Extras, the Ricky Gervais comedy. Um, I, I don't think Gervais always gets it right on some of the things that he does, but he tackles things sometimes. And there's an episode in, in Extras where it had um, the brilliant cerebral palsy actor whose name, I can't remember her name now, but there's a scene where she comes in and Gervais's character sort of points and says, oh, look at her, she's drunk. And it was, it was something yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. I'm yeah. sure you know that one. Um, that, all well, those kind of assumptions that come up that, that, that people have. Um, I don't know what my question was. How much does it frustrate and annoy you? And, and how much do you confront it? As I got older, I do confront it. But when I was younger, I didn't. So I just took, turned away a little bit and just proved them wrong in different ways. Now I'm short tempered, not short tempered, but just I wouldn't take it anymore. So if I'm going out and someone says something that I would, I would just react and say, what you, what, yeah, what you said. Especially like when I, I can remember a time when I went into a club and my, my legs were hurt. I've been on my feet all day and I just wanted a seat. And the bouncer said, no, you're not sitting down, you kick you out. It's just things, that, yeah, it's just things like that. It's just, 
unimaginable. And was that like, because he made some presumption that you were drunk? Yeah. And obviously my cousin was there and it's like, no, he's not drunk, he's just he's just tired. And then obviously I got lippy. <laughs> and then obviously I got thrown out, so it wasn't wasn't because of that. It was just and I wasn't even drunk. But those certain things is what causes when I but like back back to your question, it was, yeah, I'm more short tempered now and says something now when I was when I was younger. When people are challenged, um it's very. It will be very difficult to look you in the eye and treat you appallingly. Whereas people will, will happily, you know, sort of behind your back, take the mickey. Or, and it's go, actually goes to what you said about social media. Yeah. You know, when people are idiots online, it's because they've got a kind of cloak of anonymity and think they'll get away with it. Then you're presented with someone like you. Um, but they're go, they're probably going through a struggling time as well, and that's probably the reason why they're saying things yeah. as well. Because what you don't know what yeah. goes behind closed doors. So they're probably struggling at the same time. So the things what they say on lo online is probably they won't say things to your face. And that's probably where social media is a bit of a... We always say that. We, we do social media sessions with, with young players and that. And anyone that trolls or says anything like that or goes out of there, really goes out of their way to make a negative comment, they're deeply unhappy people. Like you ne if you're really content, you don't feel the need to bring anyone down, to be negative, to comment, to comment anything at all. If you, you might think something, but to actually go out of your way and type it or say it is a whole nother level. And again, like you said, it, it says much more about that individual than, than you know, what you're saying. Often it's difficult. It's difficult to be on the receiving end of it and accept that. But with, the more you can do, and you know, you'd have had to do it, Scott would have had to do it. It's like, actually, I pity that person rather than actually getting angry about it or, or reacting to it in a negative way. Yeah. I can't moan about the situation I'm in because there's someone else worse off than me. Yeah. And that's the, and, and I have to be humble. Sometimes you, you, you're you high, sometimes you're low. And in the end of the day, people are probably going through difficult times, especially nowadays with cost of living and stuff like that. It's mad. If there, if there was a, a young kid that was a mad football fan that was 10 years old and had cerebral palsy, doesn't have to be a football fan, but how would you how would you uh, talk to that young kid? You didn't have a role model to look to growing up. How would you sort of look at that kid um, and maybe instead of seeing a disability, all the things that he, is, he can do and the abilities that he has got? Yeah, it's quite hard because maybe he probably gets that inspiration from social media and look at it like that, but you don't know what his family looks like as well, especially if he gets not, oh, the only reason why you can't do this is because your disability It's all right, no worries. And that people, mm. that, Wrap him, wrap him or her in the uh, in the in cotton wool, and that's probably where I would say is just take it one step at a time, and, and then I'll probably would talk to the his mum or dad or his family, who's, and then look at it in a good way mm. instead of in a bad way, and that's probably the reason why I got so I'm quite headstrong is because my mum always focused on what I could do physio. I was do up the stairs mm. as a little boy doing my physio and stuff. Yeah. And just pro not proving people wrong, but just proving that there's another way. And do you think you need that little push? You yeah. need that little push from your parents at times and challenge to go, actually, no, go on, you're fine to do this. Yeah, and, and you can't do it by yourself all the time. And you need someone, you need that helping hand to go, yeah, you are good, don't yeah. worry, you, you, here you go. Well, so what goes to your, um, your catchphrase, if you can call it that, showcasing your ability, yeah. not your disability. Um, we sit, we sit at, and, I, and before we move on to this next thing, I just wanted to quickly, just one last word on, on trolling. I'm a bit nervous about asking this question because I kind of hope the answer is no, but have you ever received nasty comments online in relation to your disability? No. Good. No. Um, the next question is, has Scott received nasty comments as a result of him being a professional footballer? Yes. <laughs> yes, I can, remember, I, can remember, I can remember a picture of, I think he scored against Rangers, and next day someone put, um, hit more monkeys at, um, on, I think, I don't know where he was, I think it was at the zoo, and he said, oh, I've just seen Scott Sinclair and his family. Or something along, I can't remember the long those lines, but like, S Scott's quite tough skin as well, and it probably, it wouldn't affect him, but family. 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 Yeah. Like, what I mean, it's being humble, mm. being humble, because sometimes, like you said, you're high, but no, forget where you are, where you come from. And that's where I always get it from my old man. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't matter how high you are, you still be humble where, where, 
where your roots are. Well, that, that actually does quite nicely then segue to, so you retired in 2015, and then you made a little comeback. I went a little comeback because the classification changed. Yeah, yeah. And as well, I didn't, when I, when I retired the first time, it, it was, I didn't feel that I left. It's because I didn't, I got pushed basically. Well, that then leads me to a question on, and obviously this is something you've wrestled with and, and come to terms with is, and I don't know whether it's the same as for, I don't want to use the word able-bodied footballers, but that loss of identity. So you are now Martin Sinclair, the former Paralympian, the former England football player. How comfortable are you with your identity and the kind of perceived loss of identity when you stop playing? I lost, I lost my routine when I was playing football and I didn't know where to go. If I was, when I was working with Southampton, if I was working with Sky, and now I'm do, doing what I'm doing now, I, I didn't have that, that routine of getting up at five o'clock, training, going back to work, and then training at lunch, and then going back to work and then training in the evening. That was my routine for a good eight, nine years. When I retired, I didn't have to get up. There was no, no, nothing to prove to myself. So I was eating wrong, I was doing whatever, and, and I wasn't having that looking after myself, basically. But like I said before, you need to have that. You, everyone needs a routine. It's, a great, it's, a, it's another great lesson for you to, to pass on to someone like Scott and Jake, um, that, that will have to go through exactly the same thing one day. And no matter if it is you know, uh, Paralympic football or if it's professional football, you know, the exact same thing. He's gone through a routine since he was 14 or 15 years old that will come to an end when, you know, hopefully he's still got another few years left, but that will come to an end. But you've already, you know, you've made those mistakes, you've had those experiences and you come through the other side. Now you get to pass it on to not just your family, but, you know, other people that, that will go through the same thing as well. Yeah, definitely. And as well, I didn't have the, my, my transition would be totally different to Scott's because he's supported by the PFA. And I wasn't support. There's nothing in place supporting with transition, with from as a disabled footballer to work. So I had to work anyway, mm -hmm. from when I was playing. So his transition would be totally different. But like you say, yeah, you're totally right. Especially his routine would be getting up, having breakfast, going to training, and then training until two, and then he usually trains again. So it, it's having that, it's fixing that routine into a different routine if you get what I mean so he needs to find something else what motivates him what gets him up in the morning and has a, puts a smile on his face basically and post playing you've you've worked with Saints Foundation you're you're, you're passionate about um, accessibility to, to to football for people with not not just cerebral palsy but but any disability yeah. um, I mean ha, have you got more out of inspire, and I don't want to use that word because I know you don't like it, but inspiring people yeah. to, to have that kind of access than you did playing or, or how does it compare? I do like that word inspiring because everyone needs to be inspired. And I think everyone needs to look at someone and say, yeah, I need to be like that. But like when I was in that job role with Saints Foundation as a Saints Development Officer, there was no one like me, especially in management positions or de decision makers. So that's the reason why you're thinking if I can do it, they can do it and, it, and it's not, not everyone wants to be the first, everyone wants to be the second because there's a pathway, there's an opportunity. So if you haven't got that confidence and that self-belief to be that first, it's going to be a lot harder for people to go, oh, and pushing that barrier because you will get barriers, you will get hiccups, you will get people challenges and it's how you react, it's not how you fall, it's how you react from that fall and at every time, if you don't have people like yourselves or for example, people with disabilities in those certain positions, you're not going to get people the next get to I can do it. They can. Have you ever had little moments when you've seen a, a, a kid with um, whether it be cerebral palsy or any other um, uh, challenge where you've turned up at a training situation and I don't know, you just sort of put the ball out of your feet and then just the pass. But the, but the fact that you've got, you know, your, your, your hand shows that yeah. you've got cerebral palsy and they think, oh my God, he looks like me and he just you know took the ball under control and, and played a great pass or talked to me about this that the other and that feeling of realization you kind of see it in their eyes yeah yeah and as well with the parents as well when I was playing football it's like oh, how, how did you do that and when I went off I my shoelace was undone and then I was doing my shoelaces like the parent was like oh my god you can do your shoelaces like 
yeah, of course I can do my shoelaces. But they probably thought there's no, um, disabled cerebral palsy people can't do it with one hand, but I do. And I always, that's what I do when I do go do, go around schools and stuff and show, oh, put a, a shoe on the table and go, do that, do, do your shoelaces. And then they do it and I say, undo it and then do it with one hand. It's just finding a solution. I, I've just been adapted when I was younger and just finding different solutions to different problems. So I have to do it in another way. Scott might do it one way, I might do it in another, but it might take me a lot longer. But like I said to you before. I'm worried Martin's going to challenge us to do our shoelaces <laughs> up with one hand and we'll fail dreadfully on that. How, um, how do you think uh, the general public can be, you know, be more understanding and be more inclusive? What kind of things would you like to see happen? It's thinking outside the box and just being, being um, changing that perception of a disability as well. I think when with Rob at the time with um, at Saints, my boss, he obviously I didn't have my GCSEs. I didn't have any clue of my disability or any clue of my disability and stuff like that. He was the one who thought outside the box and gave me a chance and show and saw my potential because I didn't have a clue about de uh, development office. So when I walked into that office, I was like rabbit in headlights. I was like, oh my God, what's happening here? But he had, he had the, the skill set to showcase, and be patient enough to say, you are good, and just being that mentor. Nowadays with organisations, they just want a, not a quick fix, but they, they don't have that patience to say, to give that person a chance and go, Oh, yeah, yeah, because it's so, so fast paced. So with Rob, I didn't have any experience. I didn't have any qualifications, but he's the person that always looked at what I could offer in that role and what I couldn't offer in that role. And there's things that he couldn't do, what I could do and talk to parents and have my, my showcase the what I went through and talk to people about my disability and have that sort of people go, that's talk, you get what I mean, that role model mm. that you can talk to, which Rob couldn't. So he offered, and that's why he looked at, and that's why he, off, he gave me the job, because he, I offered something different. It's like teams, you're in a team, people offer, you don't want people exactly like you or exactly like you, you need people who want to challenge you, or, and that's how you build a successful team, and that's how we built a successful programme down Southampton, so because everyone was different. That brings really nicely to where you are right now. Now I know you've just set, recently set up a company, which is well. Just tell us about that company and what it is you want. Yeah, to so I, it's Disability Football Collective, and it's um, improving disability representation across football. So just trying to build and organise a network of disabled people and ally with foot people in the football community, football world, to improve disability representation in the game. Because, like I said to you before. Not everyone wants to be a footballer. Not everyone wants to be a Paralympian. What if they want to be media or a groundsman or um, sports solicitor or anything like that? There's no pathway. There's no opportunities for that. So that's, that's what I want to try and do with James Chiller, who's um, a co-founder of it. Amazing. So it's going to be offering support, mentoring opportunities yeah. and, and just pulling together that kind of network of people who have a challenge, to use yeah. your word, um, but still want to work within sport, within football. Yeah. Definitely, and as, as well as trying to find a hub, building a, a platform as well for an online hub to get people in together and showcase, showcasing their ability and getting, offering feedback, giving people belief, having storytellers as well, having masterclasses of different people in um, their own workforce and talking about their workforce, like player care and um, sports slizzers and um, marketing and having people like that and then hopefully you'll get the next step with people coming through going into those certain roles. There's a massive untapped talent pool of disabled people in the workplace in general. Yeah there's not I mean there's like I mean like I said before there's no one in those places if they can't see it they won't be it they can't and that's where you need people in those positions to go if I can do it they can do it everyone needs role models it's not just disabled people everyone needs to look up to someone to go yes I can do this um, I know it's early days for the company but if there's anyone listening who wants to get involved wants to help um, how can they do that 
that's we're hopefully setting up a, a website or a holding page which they can get in touch and then they set put the details on there and me and james will um, contact you amazing well look we will um uh certainly on our social media promote that once it's ready and um i'm sure we can we can add to the description on the um uh on the podcast description as well once that's up and running but i mean you've had an incre incredible life um incredible success as a football player as a man as a dad dad yeah i haven't even touched on that as well <laughs> but we were discussing the challenges of having teenage daughters and all yeah. kind of bits and bobs like that um it's an absolute honor and privilege to have you on this podcast martin thank you very much cheers thank you, thank you.